Hello and welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about concept formation, the ultimate goal of things that we have been talking about, like discrimination training, matching to sample, stimulus equivalence. So, you know, on some level, the purpose of this is to create bigger concepts. Concepts are an important part of learning in almost every subject and social skills. So what is concept formation? It's the process of grouping stimuli into classes. Learners group stimuli based on shared features or relations. And what this does is it enables the identification of new examples. So it's that whole when they are learning things without being trained, the emergent relations. Learners can recognize new examples of a concept without direct teaching. If you think about this in a broader picture, our overall goal is that these kids become independent within their learning and they're able to learn on their own and they don't need therapy anymore. They may not need as much support. If you can get these concepts to start being formed, this affects their whole life in lots of different ways, and it is kind of an ultimate goal. This is the foundation for language, which is a huge thing. Our ability to communicate, whether that's with a device or PECs or sign language, will affect how we do in our world or how we're able to function in our world categorization and adaptive behavior. So the core processes is that we'll talk about stimulus generalization later on, but that's pulling. So when you're responding to this stimuli in a way, you behave when you see this stimuli behaving in the same way when you see a similar stimuli, it's, it's pretty much the opposite of stimulus discrimination. And so stimulus discrimination is knowing to do something with this stimuli and not do it with this stimuli. And then abstraction is another core process in concept formation, focusing on defining the features. Why is this a concept? Because each one of these has these features. So we have a couple ways we can put things together in a concept based on features. The first is feature based. It's by a physical attributes like color, shape, size, take trees. Trees is a broad concept. There's lots of different trees within the concept of trees. If you look at what scientifically is a tree, you may not unless you have some sort of emerging tree scientist might not need to teach that on a scientific level by the time an individual decides they want to study trees. But we may have to teach kids or clients what's a tree, what's a bush, what's a flower. In general, you could say maybe bark or leaves. But then when you go deep, sometimes there's other things that don't go into the concept that have it. So sometimes you have to go something with bark and leaves. And I think that is how we conceptualize trees. So, but those are all the physical attributes. Sometimes it's an arbitrary concept, like the word dog refers to the animal. And then sometimes it's relational based on the relations to other stimuli, like what are bigger stimuli or what things are big. That would all be relational. You might teach a client large and small, there's an element when it's relational that there's subjectivity. I might say a television is large, but someone else might say a car is large. You have to make rules for it. Once you're seeing emergent relations, you can start teaching concepts. Present a variety of examples and non-examples to build their generalization and their ability. Like say, that's a tree, that's a tree, that's a bush, that's a tree. So you're just showing them lots of different trees. So you can use matching to sample. You put an array of things and you have them match it. You can also use sorting activities where you sort them by physical category. So again, this becomes like a mastery thing. A lot of times when we're talking about mastery, we are talking about 90% across untrained examples to demonstrate mastery. What typically happens is you start with like matching, per matching to sample procedures. And once they're pretty good at that and they've learned a lot through matching to sample, and there are emergent relations, you would move to teaching concepts. And so you're going to use a lot of the same rules to teach those concepts. So like the accuracy criteria and the mastery criteria. 
And so then you might do novel probes to see if you have those emergent relations. So you'll test with pictures or objects they've never seen to see if this concept has generalized. Can we identify 90% of the pictures of trees that I show you or more? And then you'll do a stimulus generalization test. So you'll vary the color sizes context to ensure broad concept application. So you'll, you know, it's similar data recording as matching to sample or DTT. The first one we talked about, the natural training ones that we talked about. So you're going to track the percent correct of the responses per session, and you're going to monitor the prompt level. So note the level of prompting required. So are you using no prompt, gestural prompts, verbal prompts, model prompts? You'll also measure response latency. Concepts are harder for everybody. They're a more advanced knowledge base. So we start getting longer latencies when we go to bigger concepts. And so longer latencies mean that what ha the problem with longer latencies, which it could be processing, we always have to keep that in mind, is that you know, you know to wait, you know, you know this person, you've been working with them for a while, and you know to wait for their response. But when they go to the real world, and they're asked similar questions, and they know this in therapy sessions, the other people around them won't know to wait. So we do want to get the latency to kind of an acceptable range for whatever environments they're in. And that that's also kind of dependent on where they're mainly going to be. You know, if they're spending most of their time in a special ed classroom, those people are probably trained to wait for responses. But if they're not, if they're in the gen ed classrooms, those teachers typically aren't as good at waiting or knowing to wait because most of their kids don't have long latencies. You want to keep that in mind and make sure you measure that. Academic skills, we teach vocabulary, categories, math set, science classifications. We can also teach daily living skills, sorting laundry by color, identifying safe and unsafe tools, social skills, recognizing emotions and roles and community helpers. These are all things that are super helpful for. The more advanced the skills, the more likely it's touching on concepts. And it's very important that you, you know, start, te they start learning their concepts. Common pitfalls and solutions. A lot of times we get over, when we're trying to teach dog. Dog is an interesting concept. When you think about a Maltese and like a Newfoundland, a Newfoundland I always say this and then I have people ask, what's a Newfoundland? I grew up with them. They're the big black and white dogs that are lifeguard dogs. So they swim in the water, but they look like a the same. They're huge, furry, like a big bear, pretty much. What happens is we have to teach this ch this person you're working with that we're going to teach dogs. We got to teach them that a Newfoundland and a tiny little white Maltese that looks different colors, different sizes, different everything are both dogs. It's hard. Dogs hard. There's lots of different dogs. They all look very different. And it's something kind of important. Most people know when something's a dog, when something's a coyote, when something's a cat, when something's, you know, a rabbit. And so you may want to, you do want to teach that, but it's a harder one. I've seen this happen a lot. We start doing dog and then Every four-legged animal is dog to that person. So you'll have to do some discrimination. Make sure you introduce clear non-examples and reinforce correct rejections. Then we also have under-generalization. So the learner fails to identify novel examples. So they only recognize a chair when it's brown because in their house, all the chairs are brown. Like that's what the things, all the things around the dining table are. And so they go to another house and they have like a gray bench and that is a chair. You can sit in that and like eat at the table, but they don't know to call that a chair. And so under generalization, you want to make sure you have multiple varied examples. Bean bag chair is a one that can be hard. It looks completely different, but it is a chair. So when we're trying to teach them all chairs, they know that when they identify a chair, it's a place that they can sit. And that's what it's used for. It's not used for like bouncing or like turning over and climbing on or whatnot. 
So you want to make sure you have all the varied examples. It's funny. Everyone thinks this is easy until you have a broader concept and you look at all the different examples like Google chair, Google unique chairs. And you'll be like, whoa, like I didn't even know that was a chair. I didn't know. So you didn't have full concept of a chair. So, and really we should, like when you see the very artsy exotic chairs or whatnot, it's unlikely that they may see that chair in the future. A lot of them are like this one design that this one designer did and it's in a couple houses or whatever. But still, it's good to get kind of a broad understanding of chair if you're teaching that. So prompt dependence, yeah, this always happens. Learner can only respond with the correct prompts. So you want to fade your prompts, least to most. They need to do this independent for it to be a concept that they understand. <laughs> okay, so relational concepts are really hard to teach because they're based on relations, but they will come up. Concept hierarchy, so build subcategories. So fruit, so we have fruit, and then we under fruit is apples. And under apple, there's like, I mean, if you go to the store these days, every store has at least five different apples and sometimes more. Though they look similar, they're often very different colors and sizes. So you want to make sure they're learning that and seeing the nestled classes. Analog relations. So you want to make sure that you're getting those emergent relationships. And then graphic organizers. It really helps when we get into bigger concepts. We It's really helpful to use diagrams and chart this visually. So what would you do when teaching concepts? You would prepare the set, implement the training, collect and graph the data, collaborate, and then embed this into their natural routine so that when they walk in a room, they can identify a chair if they want to sit down. You start going in different rooms where they might need to identify that.